Jesus, the Christ, is amazing. He really is remarkable. There's nothing about him that is lacking. There is nothing that is missing in his person, in his works, in his nature, in his attributes. He is incomparable. That we ought to be amazed at him at every turn, at every moment. And sometimes it's kind of scary to be his follower. In a world that is hostile to Christ, in a world filled with unbelief, in a world that at times is marked by persecutions, in a Christian life that is often marked by suffering, it's scary to believe in Jesus. We who are timid and weak in faith can tremble, at times be terrified. I want to put in front of you this evening the Gospel of Mark. And, and just to highlight a few things as you look into the, uh, into the Gospel of Mark for a lifetime ahead of you, if you were to mark out some key words, words like amazement, marveling, wondering, another set of key words related to fear, terrifying, trembling, being afraid. You might also notice the word immediately through the book of Mark, which sort of pushes the narrative faster and faster as we go. You put all of these things together and you're coming to grips with some of the themes that make Mark unique. We need to hurry up and be amazed at Christ, and we need to hurry up and believe in Him, and sometimes we're afraid. Mark is a gospel account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And you might think, didn't we just do that last week? We studied the book of Matthew. Matthew was an account of the life and ministry of Jesus the Christ. Why do we need two? And next week, you're going to hear from Scott Maxwell from the gospel of Luke. And then after that, the gospel of John. And we really need four accounts of the life of Christ? I mean, what do we do with these four gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? It, shouldn't one be enough? There are two general approaches to the gospel accounts being in their four flavors. Uh, we could say, let me say there are two approaches in faith. There are, of course, the unbelieving approaches that say they disagree with each other, therefore they're just human documents we shouldn't listen. Disregard that one. <laughs> But the approaches that see these are works of eyewitness accounts or the records of eyewitness accounts collected uh, by those who wrote them down. This is truly the Word of God. These are true accounts of Christ and they don't disagree with each other. What do we do with their differences? Two approaches. One is we harmonize them. We try to put them all together. Uh, maybe put them in chronological order so that we understand the story of the life of Christ better. That's not a terrible approach. In fact, that's an approach based on faith that these are reconcilable accounts, harmonizable accounts. In fact, a, a number of works throughout history have, have demonstrated that such things can be good exercises. I want to know all the details of the life of Christ in chronological order, put all the gospel accounts together. That's a good exercise. But doing that misses the message of each of the four. They are four independent books superintended by the Holy Spirit through individual human authors for certain purposes. They are written with different themes, different messages, and to different audiences. So when we come to the Gospel of Mark, this is not just Matthew redone. Uh, this is not Matthew reheated. This is not the leftovers. This gospel according to Mark is intentional. It has a message, it has a theme. It, it takes the, the truths about the life of Christ and puts them together in a way that is important for us. As we looked at Matthew last week, we saw that Matthew was primarily writing to a Jewish audience with a familiarity with the Hebrew Old Testament. And so Matthew was dependent on the Old Testament to demonstrate that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the Old Testament Messiah. He, he was the anointed one, the promised one, the expected one. He fulfilled the Old Testament expectations of what Messiah should be. 
and, and that was Matthew's message. This was the king, and he came, and he's coming back. Mark, on the other hand, is writing not as a personal eyewitness. Mark is something of the recorder of eyewitness testimony to the ministry of Christ. Mark probably wrote in Rome, probably about 68 AD, under the preaching of Peter and perhaps under the preaching of Paul as well. And he faithfully records the apostolic witness to the life of Christ in order to convey a particular message about Christ to a Roman audience. That is primarily a Gentile audience. And so you will see throughout the Gospel of Mark that he will explain Hebrew features. He's familiar with the geography, the land, the phrases of Hebrew, but he goes about to translate things like Talitha kum, which means little girl arise. You see these uh, Aramaic phrases that he will translate. Mark also uses Latin phrases that he Greekifies. It's clear that he is speaking to a different audience than Matthew was. And so his proofs about Jesus as being the Messiah don't come primarily from the Old Testament. In fact, they come from Jesus' authority and power in other ways. What is the message of the Gospel of Mark? Well, it is that Jesus is the Messiah, no doubt about that. But it comes in the context of Rome, probably in the late 60s, that is Roman Christians facing increasing opposition and hostility for being disciples of Christ. What that means is Mark is going to frame up this gospel in terms of a pressing need of his audience. Gentile followers of Jesus who are facing hostility for following Christ. I am dependent on John Anderson's divisions uh, in great measure for understanding the flow and the outline of this book. He's made some remarkable observations about the, the breaks grammatically in this book. They're going to help us thematically understand the flow of this gospel. I'm going to give you four sections. These are my titles, but they are stolen completely from John Anderson's divisions, Okay. Uh, division number one, we'll call a qualified Christ, followed by division two, a counterintuitive message, followed up by division three, a disappointing assessment, and finally, division four, a stunning rejection. Let's look at this qualified Christ, and this will take us really chapters one through the middle of chapter eight. So really the, the bulk of the book sets out at the beginning to identify Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ, the qualified one. Notice Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now this is fascinating because the way uh, Mark identifies Messiah at the very beginning is Jesus the man, Christ, the title for Messiah, and then this identifier, the Son of God. What do we not see here that we saw at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew? A human genealogy, tracing Messiah's line through uh, Adam and Abraham and eventually David. Here he is just simply the Son of God. This is an identification of Jesus as God in his divinity, and the sent one from God. This immediately qualifies him as the Christ. This is unique. And then we get at the very introduction, John the Baptist. John the Baptist prophesied by Messiah. Uh, there's a uh, grouping of several texts here, pronouns from Exodus 23, uh, wording from Malachi 3, and and quotes from Isaiah 40. This all identifies Jesus as Yahweh in the flesh, and there is a way that must be prepared for him. This lays the foundation for where Mark is going. There is a way that Messiah goes, and there is a path or a way that his disciples must follow. And we find Jesus the Christ identified, first of all, by God. He's identified by God the Holy Spirit. Look down in verse 10. Coming up out of the water at his baptism with John the Baptist, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, descending upon him like a dove. 
He is identified as the Christ appropriately by God the Holy Spirit and then vocally by the Father in verse 11. A voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. So Jesus here is identified by God. Uh, He is identified correctly by the Holy Spirit. His approval is given by God the Father. He is qualified as the Christ. His identity is revealed at the very front. He is led into the wilderness to be tempted. His identity is further ratified by his success in that temptation. And then John the Baptist goes to jail. This this is uh, recorded immediately in this gospel. And and this is striking because we might expect that um, identifying Jesus appropriately would lead to wild successes in life. And not for John the Baptist. This early human witness to the identity of Christ goes to prison. Maybe identifying with Christ is going to be difficult. Jesus then called some early disciples, beginning in verse 16. He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea. And he said, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. It's an interesting invitation. Follow me, and I'm going to make you those who call other people to follow as well. Um, what What are we going to be following here? This is, of course, following Jesus, the Messiah. But what is it going to be like to follow him? Uh, This is going to be a tougher road than maybe we expected. Notice in verse 21, we have Jesus teaching, and he has authority. Verse 21 gives us the kind of the first major section of the book. They went into Capernaum, and the section is identified by their uh, traveling into this region. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching. Again, if you're going to circle words in the book of Mark, amazed is one of those words you want to circle. You're going to find it all the way through the book. Why were they amazed at his teaching? Because his teaching came with authority, not as the scribes. The authority was evident in its content. And then Jesus had the authority in his power, even over an unclean spirit, verse 23. And notice in verse 24, the demon recognizes. He says, what business do we have with each other? What is it to you and what is it to me, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Now, why would a demon say that about a mere man born uh, on the wrong side of the tracks, growing up in Nazareth? I know who you are, he says, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, told him to be quiet. Jesus needed to be identified as the Christ, but not then and not by the demon. What's striking here is Jesus' identity is outed by the demon. He had authority in his content in teaching, authority over the spiritual realm. In verses 29 to 31, we find Jesus healing And he clearly has healing authority over sickness. In verse 32 to 34, he has authority over sickness and over demons. Look at verse 32. After the sun had set, they were bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city gathered at the door. There's a recognition that there is something here. There is something in this man. There is authority to teach, authority over demons, authority over illness. In verse 35, while it was still dark, the text tells us, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying. That's an interesting scene. If it were you or I and the crowds were amassing and you were gaining in popularity, you might stick around. Something good might happen. Jesus evades the crowds over and over and over again in this gospel. That's going somewhere, revealing his identity and his mission. Notice what he says in verse 38. Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach. That's what I came for. There was a message Jesus intended to convey. 
a message about the kingdom, a message about himself. There, there is good news to come. And his ministry was not going to be all about his authority over sickness and demons. This authority is demonstrated in verses 39 to 44 by authority over leprosy and more demons. Verse 39, he went to their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching, casting out demons, and a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees and saying, if you are willing, make me clean. And notice Jesus is moved with compassion, verse 41. Moved with compassion towards one who was an outsider by his unclean skin disease. Immediately, verse 42 says, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. You see a lot in the book of Mark about those who are inside and outside, and it sort of flips the script of what we might expect. Here the leper is welcomed in and healed. Look at verse 45. He went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed in unpopulated areas where they were coming to him from everywhere. You see, early on in his ministry, the public popularity of, of Jesus was even becoming a hindrance to his plan. He was identified by God at the beginning, identified by a demon appropriately. He was identifiable by his authority in his teaching, his authority over sickness, his authority over demons. He was identifiable as Messiah by his compassion for outsiders. And then he is identifiable by his authority over traditions and conventions in chapter 2. Here Jesus heals a paralytic. He clearly has authority over the man's lameness. But the demonstration of Jesus' authority to heal him is a demonstration of Jesus' authority over sins. Look at verse 5. Jesus said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. The grumbling leadership complains. Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. No one can forgive but God alone. Jesus knew what they were thinking, said, why are you reasoning about these things? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? It's a rhetorical question. Obviously, anybody can say your sins are forgiven. That's invisible. Only God will know whether it was true or not. But if somebody said, get up and walk to a lame man, That would be demonstrable, whether someone had authority over such things. And notice verse 10. So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. Jesus had already proven he had authority over illness and disease. He here was proving he had authority over sin. He did have heavenly authority to forgive sin. It is something only God can do. And he, as God in the flesh, just did it. To the consternation of the religious authorities. Again, these ones felt like they were the doorkeepers to uh, everyone having access to God or not. And Jesus blew the doors off. Jesus had authority over sin. Authority uh, to call sinners to himself. Look at verse 14. He called Matthew. We looked at this last week. What was Matthew by profession? A tax collector, an outsider, a sinner uh, of the most heinous proportions in Israel in that day. He was a sellout and a traitor and a sinner. In the following scene in verse 23 of chapter 2, Jesus is breaking up their traditions. He's demonstrating not only that he came to call the sinners, not those who thought they were righteous, but he was also blowing up the traditions of those who consider themselves to be better than others and following God's law. Here, Jesus concludes the scene in verse 28. The Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. He is the ultimate authority. As God in the flesh, he's the one that invented the Sabbath, He's the one that knows what's good to do and not do on the Sabbath. And his authority identifies him as the one. He's bigger than their traditions and conventions. Look at Mark chapter 3. 
Here, Jesus openly challenges the synagogue system. Again, on the Sabbath, this is intentional. He entered there, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they were watching him, verse 2, to see if he would heal on a Saturday so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come up, come forward. He's going to do this in front of everybody. And then he challenges the synagogue. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, to do harm or to do good, to save a life or to kill? And they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved, notice this, at their hardness of heart. What was the root of this challenge of authority? For the leadership, it was unbelief. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man who had no ability to stretch out his hand, obeyed the command of Jesus, and his hand was healed. The man with the withered hand couldn't do anything with that hand. It was useless. And at the very command of Jesus, there was power to stretch it out. This authority over the physical realm was a demonstration of Jesus' authority over the spiritual realm as well, and a rejection of the so-called authority of the Pharisees. And look at verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians. Those two groups aren't buddies, but now they have a common enemy as to how they might destroy him. What is the response to this qualified Christ who's been identified by God as Messiah, identified by a demon, identifiable by his authority over sickness and, and demons and illness? He's identifiable by his compassion. He's identifiable by his authority over their traditions and conventions. He's here in Mark 3, identifiable by his incomparable power to do the impossible, and he is rejected. Rejected. Could you imagine being in the room? And you just watch the impossible happen, and you're worried about what day it occurred. What's the real issue? The hardness of heart and unbelief driven to murderous intent. This is not just a, oh, I could take him or leave him. Yeah, Jesus is just all right with me. Doobie Brothers response. This is, we want to kill him. This is an outlandish rejection of a qualified Messiah. In verse 7, you see the crowds following him. The demons recognize him again in verse 11. Look down at verse 11. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God! Do you remember how Mark started? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus, Messiah, the Son of God. Who's getting it right so far? The demonic hordes. Not the religious leaders. The disciples aren't going to get it right for quite a while. Jesus chooses the 12 in verses 13 to 19. And then he returns home. Look at verse 20. He came home and the crowd gathered again to such an extent they could not even eat a meal. And then the scribes had come from Jerusalem and they were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebul. He casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And Jesus demonstrates the faulty logic of the argument. But look at verse 31. Really, verse 20 and verse 31 give us the, the, the main idea of what's going on here. The background to that was the scribes claiming there was satanic involvement. But he came home in verse 20, verse 31, his mothers and his brother, his mother, singular, and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and they called him. Uh, what were they trying to do? They're, they're trying to get him to. Stop being out there in public and, and, and just kind of going over the top with, with the message and, and the powers. They're trying to put a leash on him here. And Jesus' response is to his mothers and brothers being outside. Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, this is my brother and sister and mother. He's identifying faith as those who believe him in who he is. And he's identifying that even those who were closest to him had moments of unbelief or even categorical unbelief for some of them. That moves into a parable about belief and unbelief in chapter 4, the parable of the soils. Uh, 
There's one believing soil and the rest are, are manifestations of unbelief uh, that look like sort of temporary agreement or uh, partial excitement, but then other things choke out that incipient faith. Look at verse 12. There are consequences of unbelief. This is the doctrine of judicial hardening, Jesus says here. While seeing, they may see not. While hearing, they may hear not and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. This is a a serious warning in the midst of some parables about belief. In the midst of Jesus being absolutely amazing, credentialed, and obviously the Messiah. And then facing rejection at home, rejection from the leadership. Basically rejection from nearly every human character in the story so far. And Jesus says, watch out. You might not always be able to believe. You stiff arm God when his word is clear. And you may face judicial hardening. The consequence of unbelief may be more unbelief. You may get what you want. Jesus in verses 21 to 25 then tells him, take care how you listen. Kingdom parables follow and they're given in mystery. Um, Just like we saw last week in Matthew, there's going to be parables given and then explanations given to insiders. This is part of the judicial hardening. You don't want to listen to Messiah. You don't want to embrace his message. Uh, You may not always get the freedom to hear and to listen. Jesus demonstrates his authority over the sea in verse 35. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let's go over to the other side. They went in the boat, fierce winds came up. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. Notice what happens next. The wind died down and it became perfectly calm. The meteorological conditions identified him as Messiah. I don't think in this life I'll ever forget standing with Rick Holland on this hill overlooking the sea and Rick preaching from this text the next scene, the Gerasene demoniac. Uh, We drove up this winding hill and there were the caves right there where this guy would have been living who we find out has legions of demons inside of him. Why was he on the scene? Why did he approach Jesus and the disciples? Well, he would have experienced the same storm they did. He would have experienced the shocking realities that the wind stopped instantly after these guys are being tormented at the oars, driving across the wind in this impossible race against a storm. All of a sudden, uh, the The storm is calm and the waves are done. That's not normal. That's eerie. That's supernatural. Something stronger than a legion of demons just walked up on the shore and this guy full of demons is headed for a confrontation. Immediately, Mark reports, verse 2, the man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Look what he says in verse 7. Jesus, son of the most high God, Here's another proper identification. I implore you by God, do not torment me. Again, he understands the power this one has. And then you're familiar with the story. The demons have to ask permission to not immediately go to demon prison. Instead, can we go into those pigs? They run the herd of pigs off the the cliff into the sea. The locals are frightened. The disciples are frightened. Look at verse 15. They became frightened, understatement. Verse 20, everyone was amazed. Jesus crossed in the boat again to the other side and carried on more healings. Listen, the disciples missed it even though the weather understood who he was. The disciples missed it even though the demons knew who he was. And then you have two Gentiles in Mark 5. Uh, Jairus, the synagogue official whose daughter got sick and died, and then uh, a hemorrhaging woman who would have been, again, considered an outsider and helpless uh, because of her bleeding. She would have been uh, unavailable for 
temple procedures. She would have been considered unclean and kept outside. Jesus has compassion by both. Of course, with the raising of Jairus' daughter, Jesus' identity is identifiable by his authority over death. In Mark chapter 6, he goes back to his hometown and he sees unbelief. Verse 2, Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many listeners were astonished and they said, where did this man get this wisdom? Who gave him the power for these miracles? Is he not the carpenter? Don't we know his parents and his brothers? And notice Jesus' response in verse 6 of chapter 6. And Jesus wondered at their unbelief. People were amazed at Jesus, and Jesus was amazed at the people's lack of faith. Again, at every point, he's identified clearly by all of these elements, natural and supernatural, that he is the Christ. And yet the people close to him did not believe. John the Baptist gets beheaded. The 12 are sent out, commissioned to Jesus uh, to preach and to heal. And then you have the 5,000 fed, beginning in Mark 6, 33. Many people recognized them. They ran on foot from the cities and they got to the spot ahead of them. When Jesus, felt, uh, when Jesus went ashore, verse 34, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What did Jesus know about these people? They, they needed spiritual shepherding. They needed spiritual food and he felt compassion for them. He, he fed them to demonstrate that he actually was the good shepherd that could give them what they needed. And they missed the point. What, what did the crowd do? They, they were glad to be satisfied by the food. And yet they weren't being satisfied by his words and by himself. The last part of chapter 6, Jesus walks on water and a remarkable scene here where Jesus identifies himself as God. A couple of clues to this, verse 48, as the disciples again are being tormented at the oars. They're straining against the wind. And the end of verse 48 says, he intended to pass by. I think this is probably a reference to Exodus 34, 6. Uh, the, where God passed by Moses and, and communicated his compassion to him. They saw him and they were terrified. He spoke with them and said, take courage, it is I. And the it is I there is, a, is an ego a me or an I am. Don't be afraid, I am. Right here in the context of, of passing by, I think all of these are references to Jesus identifying himself as God. There are more healings. Look at verse 52. The disciples had not gained insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. All the evidence on display that this Jesus is the Christ and and the disciples don't quite get it. Mark 7 deals with what's clean and what's dirty. The disciples are the, uh, the... The Pharisees, the leadership of Israel, the religious hoity-toities, they're clean on the outside. Jesus reveals, uh, you're actually filthy, and the heart is the problem. Uh, Look down at verse 21 of Mark 7. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. These are the things which proceed from within and defile. You're not getting dirty before God because of stuff on the outside. The Pharisees' traditions of you've got to wash your hands just a certain way so you can be clean. God sees right through all of that and knows what's going on in the heart. And then immediately Mark moves on to the Syrophoenician woman. She's dirty in their accounting. She's outside. She's a Gentile, verse 26, of the Syrophoenician race. And Jesus comes to her and helps her in her time of need. Verse 37, you get another amazing word. They were utterly astonished. 
They recognize Jesus' power. They recognize his ability, his authority, again, over physical weakness. They don't quite understand his mission. In Mark chapter 8, you have a large crowd. They probably are a response crowd to that garrison demoniac that got healed. This is in Gentile territory. Now 4,000 are fed. The disciples are still unbelieving. Uh, Jesus says, hey, provide for them food. This just after the feeding of the 5,000. They should know how this works. And they don't get it. Or, or maybe their unbelief is expressing itself in a reticence to help Gentiles. Maybe they don't like the outsiders. Whatever the case, Jesus says, you have hardened hearts. Do you not see? Do you not yet understand? Verse 21. And verse 21 ends this first section. If you summarize this first section, uh, we, we would say this is a qualified Christ. And what is the response of the sinful humanity that needs a qualified Christ? Unbelief. That they don't understand. They do not see. They do not get it. What follows next, uh, the major section here beginning in verse 22 of chapter 8, uh, I would call a counterintuitive message. Okay, we get the right Messiah. Now, what is his message? The, the short story of all of this is Jesus the Christ came to suffer and following him is going to mean suffering. This isn't what people necessarily wanted to hear. What's interesting is verse 22 of chapter 8 begins with a story about a blind man. And the first blind man that gets healed in this section gets healed partially, progressively. It's like a process. Can you see yet? How about now? How about now? Are you getting it? And the section ends with another healing of a blind man, Bartimaeus, and he gets healed instantaneously. And it's almost kind of a, a creative literary way to bracket this section of, do you understand the qualified Messiah's message about suffering? Do you see it yet? Okay, now you see it. It's an interesting way to, to highlight this major section. You need to open your eyes to this counterintuitive message. Look at verse 29 of chapter 8. <laughs> it's out there somewhere. All right, verse 28. Uh, they told him, saying, some people say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And Jesus questioned them saying, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Okay, that's pretty good. It doesn't get everything that Mark 1.1 introduced. Remember how Mark 1.1 introduced it? What are we supposed to get about Christ? He's the Messiah, the Son of God. Peter gets pretty far down the road at, at identifying Jesus properly as the Messiah. This is good. And what follows? Look at verse 31. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. He was stating the matter plainly. What was Peter's response? A rebuke. He didn't, he didn't get it. We've taken all this time, these eight chapters, to properly identify Christ. And now the properly identified Christ is going to tell us what his message is. I'm going to Calvary. And if you're going to follow me, you're going to suffer too. And Peter says, nope, that's not the right message. Did, you got the memo wrong, Jesus. And so for the next two chapters, essentially, Jesus walks point by point describing more suffering. In chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, there's going to be suffering. That follows right after Jesus was identified by God in the transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Okay, we got the right Messiah. Is this the right message? More suffering, Jesus says. Chapter 9, 30 to 32, more suffering. 33 to 37, you actually have to be humble. Not seeking after greatness, more suffering. Get rid of the elitism in verse 38 of chapter 9. You've got to be humble. Listen, if pride keeps you out of heaven, cut it out. Pluck out your eyes. Cut off your hands. Mark 10 is more of the same. A humbling message on marriage. Jesus described what marriage was supposed to be. Unbreakable union between a husband and wife. And the disciples are like, this does not compute. <laughs> 
Why wouldn't that compute? You and I think that's so romantic. They've been married 56 years. Wow, way to go. I've, I've ha- loved one woman my whole life. Isn't that great? That's so beautiful. The disciples didn't say that. They're like, uh, what? We can't break this thing off when it gets hard? I can't be selfish? Uh, These are tremendously humbling messages Jesus is giving to them. And then you've got to be like children in chapter 10. And then you have the story of the rich young ruler. Everybody would say he's the elite. He's blessed. He's got God on his side. He's got everything going for him. Look how well he's doing in life. He must have this thing right. And while Jesus felt a love for the man, he saw his idolatries and he was turned away. All of that ends with the statement, the last will be first and the first will be last. This is a counterintuitive message. This is not going the way the disciples might have hoped. Okay, we got the right Messiah. That's our ticket to fame and stardom and power and prestige and a place. Those Pharisees have a place. We want a place like that. And Jesus is saying, it's not going like that at all. The Gentiles think that way. They lord it over one another. You be humble. You're going to suffer. What follows in the remainder of chapter 10 is stories about humility as slaves. The Messiah is a slave. If you're going to follow in his path, walk on his way, you must be a humble servant as well. And chapter 10 ends with the healing of blind Bartimaeus all in an instant. And it's like, oh, okay, I got it. Got the message. Now I see. Right, Messiah? And his way, his path, and his message is one of suffering. Where does that lead us? That leads us to the third section. And it is what I would call a disappointing assessment. Chapter 11 to the middle of chapter 14. And this assessment goes two ways. Jesus is being assessed by the crowd. And then Jesus is assessing the assessors. How does this go? Not well. It begins in chapter 11 with the triumphal entry. This, of course, is a fulfillment of of Zechariah 9.9. Your Messiah will actually come to you on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And this is a fulfillment of Daniel 9.25, down to the very moment, down to the very day that Daniel prophesied Messiah as king would enter into Jerusalem. And and how did it go? Uh, There are, of course, fanfare, people that are excited, people that have gotten on the, 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 the train, uh, they, they've gotten on the bandwagon of, of fanhood, of, of this Christ figure, but they don't accept him for who he truly is, and they don't particularly embrace his message. Of course he's popular when they get free lunches, and their physical discomforts are taken away. But what about when it means to follow him into suffering in faithfulness? Right after the triumphal entry, you get this shocking scene. Verse 13 of chapter 11. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. What does that mean? This was not the season for fruit in Israel. This is a a metaphor, physical tree, as a metaphor of a spiritual condition of an apostate nation when Messiah arrived. It's tragic. They assessed him, blessed be the king, and in the end, we know he's rejected. That rejection was already in the heart. It would manifest itself in the politics. And Jesus sees straight through it all and sees a fruitless Israel. This is a disappointing assessment. After designating a fruitless Israel, he discovers the corrupt temple. He doesn't discover it, he reveals it. He goes in and cleanses the temple He was driving out those who were buying and selling. This was supposed to be a a house of prayer and honor to his father. Verse 18 says, The chief priests and scribes heard this, and they began seeking how to clean up the temple because he was right. No, they began seeking how to destroy him. Again, unbelief in the heart of the spiritual leadership of the nation to the degree of murderous intent. This is disappointing. They should have welcomed him. They should have recognized him. They should have embraced his message. They should have known this is the one that was fulfilling all the hopes of the Old Testament. 
Verses 27 to 33 detail the unbelief of the leadership in dramatic fashion. Then you get to Mark 12. Jesus tells a parable. And he describes those who were workers in a vineyard who killed the messengers of the owner of the vineyard. Jesus is speaking to them. He's exposing their murderous intent. He's telling them, you, you don't own this vineyard. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. And you're actually trying to kill the people that belong to the owner. Verse 12 says they were seeking to seize him. <laughs> what was their response to this exposure? Yeah, we really have to kill him now. But they feared the people. They understood that he spoke the parable against them. So they went away. This is followed up by the traps, sort of the trick questions they try to get him in. Uh, Jesus' truth is so demonstrably obvious, they're ashamed, uh, they turn away, they stop asking questions. Look at verses 35 and to 37. Jesus began to say to them, as he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. David calls him Lord. In what sense then is he his son? And notice they didn't ask him any more questions. Why? What was Jesus doing here? He was identifying himself as the Son of God, as David's Lord, and as Messiah, all in one rhetorical question. They refused to answer it. They knew the implications of it. They rejected him in unbelief. Look at Mark 13. Here the disciples have a wrong assessment. They say, good teacher, look at these wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. They're walking through the temple complex and they're saying, isn't this cool architecture? What had just happened? Jesus announced the, the corruption of the leadership. And then you see that corruption of the leadership on display and the poor widow who's giving her last two copper coins she needed to survive on in order to line the pockets of the corrupt leadership, build their beautiful buildings. That is not a, a message on how to give, by the way. That is a message on the corruption of the leadership. And then the disciples are enamored by the buildings that were built uh, by the oppression of the poor that the leadership was supposed to care for. And Jesus said, you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another that will not be torn down. What follows is the series of judgments from the apostolic age through the church and gospel age into the tribulation age and all the way up to the return of Christ era. That fills Mark 13. And the point of all of that is they've got the wrong assessment. They're looking on the outsides of things. Jesus sees straight through to the heart and he knows what the problem is. He himself is the answer. Mark 14 then prepares Jesus and his disciples for the suffering that is to come. First part of Mark 14 is the, the dinner party and the woman who anoints Jesus with oil. Jesus said, this is preparation for my burial. And then he prepares the disciples with the Passover meal telling them again that he's going to leave, that he's going to suffer. Verse 27 says, the, the shepherd will be stricken down and the sheep will be scattered. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane and this leads to the final section. We've seen a qualified Messiah, his counterintuitive message, the disappointing assessment all around, followed by the stunning rejection. This begins in verse 32. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was troubled. He fell to the ground. He pleaded with the Father if there was another way to take this cup from him. He yielded himself to the will of his Father. Verse 43 is the betrayal by Judas. Then we see the dispersion of the disciples. In verses 53 to 65, he is accused by the spiritual leaders of Israel. Beginning in verse 66, he's even disavowed by Peter. In Mark 15, in verse 1, he's condemned by the rulers, traded for a criminal, and rejected by the nation. 
And then verses 16 to 21, he's mocked by the soldiers. And then verses 22 to 38, he's murdered on a cross. Right in the middle of that, verse 34, he's abandoned by God. Why, he cries out, have you forsaken me? Look at verse 39, Mark 15. When the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was, do you see it? The Son of God. What has Mark been driving at from verse 1? This is the good news of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, who is the first human to identify him that way. A Roman centurion, a Gentile, who is carrying out his execution. This whole book has really been a tragedy of the response of unbelief to the right Messiah and the right message. What is Mark's point? What is he driving at in all of this? You Roman Christians facing persecution for following Christ, listen, you've got the right Messiah. He is the Son of God. He's amazing. And you're trembling. Take courage. There were women looking on from a distance, verse 40. He was grieved by those women. He was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. That leads to Mark 16. And Mark 16, this last installment of the Gospel of Mark, it runs from verse 1 to verse 8. Really, that is where the Gospel of Mark ends. On the Bible wall in the hallway, it ends at verse 8. There is no verses 9 through 20. And if you want to know why there shouldn't be verses 9 through 20 in your Bibles, I would encourage you to listen to Grace to You and the final sermon from the Gospel of Mark by John MacArthur. And he explains in an hour why those verses shouldn't be in your Bible. I won't take the time to do that there. I'm just going to read to you the actual ending of Mark. Let's read it together. When the Sabbath was over... Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe and they were amazed what, what, what should they have been at this point? Believing? Believing Jesus was the right Messiah and his message of suffering that he had taught again and again and again in this book that he would actually die and rise again. They were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He's not here. Behold, here's the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, and tell Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Period. End of gospel. <laughs> That's how it ends. Fear was that word that had gone through the whole book. Amazement had gone through the whole book. Trembling and astonishment had gone through the whole book. And here's where it ends. Again, Peter is the one preaching these messages in Rome. Mark is writing them down and records it this way for us. What is the encouragement? If you put yourself in Rome in the late 60s A.D., Jesus is amazing. And sometimes it's scary to be his follower. Do I have what it takes to walk in his way? To, to walk in his path? To take up my cross and follow him? To deny myself? To not seek after worldly greatness, but to be like a child? To be humble? To face trouble and hardship? If I can have him, yes. That's the point of the gospel of Mark. You may be little, Christian. You might be little in the eyes of a great big world. You might be small in the eyes of the Roman Empire. You might face difficulty and persecution. Uh, 
maybe even rejection by your family and the culture. But you've got the right Messiah. And a message about suffering, it's not the wrong message, it's the right one. Belief. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this good news. The good news of the kingdom right at hand. The king was here. And he was rejected, despised, spat upon, beaten, disbelieved. Oh Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Let us be faithful witnesses to this Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, as long as you give us breath. Amen.